This is game day weekend. Now, let me say this up top. Some of you will say, uh, is this going to be one of those services where it's all about sports and you're going to be like, and David was like the quarterback and he had five stones. Like, I'm, yes. <laughs> no, but this is going to be one of those weekends that we're definitely going to be talking about and kind of running parallel with some sports analogies. But the truth is, if you'll lean in, the Holy Spirit will absolutely speak to you if you will make room. Look at the person next to you and say, make room. But before we dive in, last weekend, we kicked off something called Black History Month Spotlight. Black History Month started on February 1st of this year, but I want to do a Black History Spotlight as a church every week, and this weekend specifically, we want to talk about Jackie Robinson. Come on, somebody, Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, just to give you a little insight, was the first African-American to play in Major League Baseball. Robinson established and blazed a trail for all that would follow in his footsteps. He made a mark not only on Major League Baseball, but literally sports overall. He made history when he started for first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15, 1947. His accomplishments were so far spread, but some of his actual baseball accomplishments was he won, won Rookie of the Year that year. That's incredible. He was a six-time All-Star, World Series champ. His determination to fight for what he stood for, spoke volumes across the nation. And it was so much more than about baseball. Robinson's faith served as a source of inspiration, motivation, comfort, and strength, wisdom, and direction. It was the engine that drove and sustained him as he shattered racial barriers on and off the baseball field. Today, we honor the life of and remember the life of Jackie Robinson. Can we go ahead and honor him on Black History Month? We have another friend in the house. His name is Bobby Meacham. He played for the Yankees for a long time, still works in Major League Baseball. And I was talking to him in the lobby beforehand, and he was talking about what it is to be a black man in sports and how Jackie Robinson paved such a way even for the history and the career that he had. I think that's pretty amazing. Come on, church, we celebrate diversity. We celebrate a church that looks like heaven. Amazing. So again, this is game day weekend. This is Super Bowl Sunday, and I know that there is, uh, I know, I just want to clear up the elephant in the room. I know a lot of you, for some amount of time, have assumed, by the way, I move and I pivot and even my gait that I played football. I know, I know a lot of you are like, it wasn't a joke, I don't understand. Uh, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a segment today, because we have a lot of new family at Hope City, uh, at all of our locations, and joining us online, uh, and this segment is called uh, um, Some Things from the Pastor. And so, and so I just want to give you some insight to my life. My mom, Barbara, is watching online. Everybody say hello to Barbara. Come on. My parents are watching. And my mom watches every week, and she gives me tips, and she also says, come on, Daniel. And, <laughs> Like, yeah, anyway, she's an encourager and she's literally my biggest fan next to my wife. And so my mom growing up would never let me play football. She let me play basketball and I played at a decently high level in basketball. So, hey, don't come, you know what I mean? Don't come. But with football, she was like, you're not gonna play football. She let me like play a little bit in the neighborhood, maybe some flag football, but she would never let me play at like any kind of uh, like level, like junior high, high school, whatever. Cause she's like, you're not gonna play football. You'll break every bone in your body. I was like, amen. she's saying Amen. <laughs> But I have no statistics to back that. There's a lot of bones in the body. So I'm like, come on, mom. And then the other thing that Barbara did, which, mom, I love you. You know I want to tell this story. Uh, she would also uh, not really let us as kids be around large bodies of water. Now, I know that's completely different than football, but I'm about to tie it together. Uh, because she would say, uh, a shark will eat your whole body. I'm like, what is happening? I was like, so first my body's broken up because of football. And she's like, then you can't swim away from the shark. You've got to use you got to be smart about this. And I'm like, I don't like this. She's like, it's, not, it's like you don't like the way I'm speaking. I'm like, I just want you to speak like a human being with statistics that are real. Because I don't know about the broken bones and the sharks eating. And so 18 years later, uh, Jackie and I, we're about to celebrate 18 years coming up. Come on, somebody. That's good. But when we got married, we went to Maui, and we got the map. We did the road to Hana. How many of y'all have ever been to Maui? Like, it's a fun. Yeah, okay. It's extremely expensive. I'm still paying for it. 18 years later. Uh, <laughs> But we did like the map. We found like the secret black sand beach. And people were like, no, everybody knows about this. You can buy the mug and the t-shirt at the front. We're like, okay. We thought we were like on a scavenger hunt. But anyways, we find the black sand beach. Now, now, now let me just tell you about my wife. My wife had a brother who played at a high level in football. And she herself has a gun on her. Like she could throw a football that would rival 
uh, uh, some of y'all that have played at a, at a high level, she, she, she's really good at it. And she also um, can swim like a dolphin. And so those two things were not my story. Again, Barbara, love you, Mom. Uh, but we're on this black sand beach. My wife pulls out this bag that I didn't even know existed. And she's like, pulls out a football. And she's like, you want to throw some football? I was like, Pfft. She's like, do you like the throw football? I was like, does a shark like snacks? Which you shouldn't say. <laughs> Next to an ocean and the seeds that have been planted by Barbara all those years. And so she's like, let's throw. So I'm thinking this is like, you know, we're just, we're married. We're just happy to be on the beach together. Like, <laughs> it's like a Hallmark movie, but it turned into a Lifetime movie quick because she can throw. <laughs> and so I'm throwing it. She's zinging it back. I'm like, well, you're really playing. <laughs> throw it back. She said, ah, you got me the floater rib. Like, that's shocking. Like, you're really, you got a gun on you. And so she throws it a little too high and it goes over my head and bloop in the water. And she's like, hey, just go get it. And I was like, no problem. That's what I do. And so, and if you're not used to the beach, you, can, you look awkward just walking on sand, let alone running on it. So I'm just all over the place. And I end up getting in the water and I'm like, you can do this. Dan, you're not going to drown today. I'm talking to myself, Dan, you're okay. Like people call me Daniel, but when I'm really serious, I got to talk to myself like, Dan, you're not going to drown today. You just got married. Like this is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm like, <coughs> like I'm getting a little too far out. And I'm like, I don't know. And I'm hearing people talk about riptides and where you should swim. And it's pulling me out further. And the football is like Wilson's ball on, it's floating. I can't get to it. And she's like, just get the ball. And I'm like, I'm, tr I'm trying. <laughs> she's like, just go get it. So I'm swimming towards the ball. And the ball is always 10 feet from me. So finally, I gave up, made my way back to the beach. It took way too long. I came back super winded. I was like, here's a... There's a Dollar Tree right around the corner. We can buy another one of those balls. And she's like, it's okay. I just don't know. She, and then there's that one guy. Y'all know who I'm talking about. You might be him. You might actually, when I say it, you're like, that's me. That one guy who's a little too tan. You know what I'm talking about? Like God was like, I want him to look just like a Mattel G.I. Joe doll. Like I want this guy to be sculpted perfectly. And he had like, I don't know if it's Panama Jack a tanning so like like lotion or butter but he was slick like and he walked over and did this thing he goes <laughs> you want me to get it and I was like no David Hasselhoff we're good we're fine we're gonna go buy another ball we're leaving now and my wife's like you don't have to and he's like I got it y'all I can't back this other than the other 200 people around us when he took off running it was in slow motion and I heard, doon, 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 doon. like chariots of fire is playing. I'm like, and he ran perfectly on the beach. Like he skimmed across it. And you know you've been around water when you jump in and it doesn't move. He disappeared like a dolphin. I was like, this is unbelievable. And then he didn't, he didn't come back up. We stood on that beach and I said, babe, I'm so sorry that I didn't get that ball because a man lost his life today. He's gone. Like, he's not coming up. Let's just go. Let's pack up our stuff. Cut our losses. Like, where is he? And he came up out of the water. I'm not playing. This is not exaggerated. With such force and velocity. And in one motion, whipped up out of the water and zipped this football. And I saw it coming. So I said, like, get out of the way. And I was ready to grab it. And that ball hit me so hard in the throat. It knocked the wind out of me. It's a true story. It cut me off at the Adam's apple. I picked up the ball. I was like, thanks a lot, Slick Rick. And we were out. So that's my football story. Uh, curtsy. Okay. That's the uh, get to know your pastor segment. So today we're going to have a continuation of last week. Last week we talked about staying together, but the, 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 the the foundation of it is, is who is surrounding you? Like, who are you surrounded by was the question. You can actually go back to our YouTube channel, hopecity.com as well, and re-take a watch or, or, or re-listen to who are you surrounded by. And we talked about the importance of groups and how Jesus was even intentional about groups. And today we're going to continue, who are you surrounded by, part two. And the truth is, there's still time if you are sitting on the sidelines wondering if there's a group for you or somewhere where you can connect. Uh, the truth is, um, there, are, there are groups all over our city, thousands of people meeting. You can go to hopecity.com slash groups. If you're watching online, you can join an online group. There are literally people joining us from all over the world. How many guys are in a group already actively? Okay, cool. I already asked that earlier, but I'm setting y'all up again. Okay, cool. Uh, make sure you join a group. Last week, though, specifically, we talked about the before, beside, and behind principle. Those that go before you, the importance of a mentor and leaders that are before you pouring into you, those who stand beside you, that's accountability, that's your friends, and ultimately those who walk close 
behind you, those that you're investing into. And this week, I want you to grab this thought as we move forward, and who are you surrounded by part two, is I want you to recognize that last week, this whole process is not just for you. Come on, say it out loud, it's not just for me. Because there's this transition place that happens when you have someone that's pouring into you, someone who's standing beside you, and someone that's behind you following closely, the one who is before you should be asking you questions like, hey, what team are you on? Like, where do you serve? Have you gone through growth track? You can go to hopecity.com slash growth track if you want more information on how to be a part of our church family and how you can join the dream team. Maybe you're wondering, like, is there room for me? I've got gifts, I've got, I've got talent, and it's true. We want you to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose. You do that by going through growth track. You make a difference by joining the dream team. So the ones that go before you should be asking that question. Hey, what team are you on? Where are you serving? The one standing behind you should be asking the question to you because you're pouring into them. Hey, what time do I need to be there? How can I get involved? And you should be able to pour into you. And then the one who's standing next to you, I had to find another WT, so what team, what time? This one is what, the one standing beside you should be asking you what tacos are we eating? <laughs> That's what real accountability looks like. Like, you already know, you're serving, you're a part, you're pouring into, and then you're doing life together. So this week, I pray that you don't check out. But the Holy Spirit has something for you, even though we're gonna talk more about running a play. This weekend is run the play weekend. The play ran by the team is carried out by the players, and it's ultimately the excitement of the game. If you take a moment today and you watch Super Bowl Sunday, you'll watch, man, the plays, the passes, the touchdowns, that's what's exciting. I turn on ESPN consistently. I watch the top 10 plays across most sports because I just love the moment. But there's something else that's foundational. There's something else that's really essential to the game that's not celebrated. We don't do a top 10 play on it. Nobody's sitting in the stands like, I'm loving this moment. But it's essential and it's foundational. And it's called the huddle. Look at the person next to you and say, the huddle. The huddle isn't a part of the game where the crowd cheers. No one's marketing this moment. No one's like, I just love it. It's when they get really close and we can't tell what's happening. No cameras are allowed in there and they're just it's great. No, nobody. But it's absolutely essential. Why? Because this is the definition of the word huddle. A brief gathering of players during a game to receive instructions and the game plan. It's a group of people consulting a discussion, a conference, a meeting. And the truth is, again, the crowd, that's us, is most excited about the moments that are, that, that, that are carried out through play. But the huddle is where they all get on the same page. The huddle is a crucial part. Again, why? Because it's where everybody gets on board with the master plan, the coach, the coaching staff talks to the quarterback, and then ultimately the plays are called to be ran. And it's ever-changing. The huddle, as time goes on, it gets more aggressive. It gets more intense. Things get more intentional as the play is ran and the time runs out. Look at the opposite person next to you and say, you belong in the huddle. Come on, let them know. Come on, look at your second choice again and say you're on the team. Come on, say it, tell them. So, so I want you to grab this analogy. I want you to grab this parallel. We gather here at West Houston, Cinco Woodlands. We have a campus in Tanzania, for those of you who don't know. We have a soon-to-be Uganda campus. We have people literally watching all over the world, watching on our online location. And the truth is, every single week, if you look at this parallel, this is the huddle. This is where we gather weekly. The Holy Spirit's the coach. He ultimately speaks into the quarterback. That happens to be me this weekend. When we have other guest ministers, we've got sub-in quarterbacks. Pastor Jackie's gonna be preaching soon. She's amazing. And she's gonna throw footballs in the crowd. It's gonna be awesome to prove the story is true. No, no, but then we all gather together and we get on the same plan. We have a master plan ultimately to run the play. Because side note, if Sunday's the only time you're growing in God, you're missing out on the best days of your relationship with Jesus. If you only show up to worship a little bit, to shout a little bit, to clap a little bit, to high five some people, drink some hot chocolate and coffee, and then you leave, and then you go back on Monday to live in messy and ratchet, ee. if your neighbors, if your friends, family, and coworkers are shocked and surprised you go to church, there's work to be done. Come on. I'm stepping on somebody's toes. Like this, there's work to be done. Some of y'all, you come into church, you're like, give me Jesus. Jesus. And then you give people the H-Town thumbs up with the wrong finger. 
put entire sentences together with swear words. Come on. Look at the person next to you and say, there's work to be done. Come on, we're an interactive church. There's work to be done. Now listen, we're all a work in progress. Nobody is perfect. That's why we love people. That's why Hope City Church is in the people business. There are seasoned saints that have only watched Left Behind and Kirk Cameron films. And there are people that were acting out yesterday. Maybe you messed up even today. We're grateful for the grace of God, for every goof up, mercy for every single mistake. But the truth is, he is equipping us in this huddle to grow, to get better, to get healed, to get restored so that we can go out. That's why we huddle on purpose. Everyone say the word go. This weekend, I want to give you some plays that you can be equipped with so that we can ultimately go out to run the play as a church family. Jackie referenced this verse a few weeks ago during our celebration weekend, but it's found in Mark 16, 15. Jesus says these words, and then he told them, not he suggested, not, hey, you might want to, no, and then he told them, go, go into all the world and preach the good news. The good news literally means the gospel. We're talking about The good news, the miracle working, supernatural power of God's presence through his word. So if you're taking down notes, write this down. We have to run with purpose. We have to run with purpose. Equals go. This is a directive. Now instantly, some of y'all are like, go into all the world. I'm a glamper. I'm not going anywhere. Which side note, we've got a bunch of family from Hope City Missions going to Uganda this week. Come on, we've got teams that are going into all the world. Aren't you glad that we have a church where we don't just gather on weekends, but we actually go into the neighborhoods and the nation and our city to reach people far from God? Because we understand the directive from Jesus that we are to go. This verse right here in Romans It's extremely sobering if we don't apply it. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15 says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can anyone go, say go, and tell them without being sent? Again, I'm grateful for a church that equips, fills up, builds up, and sends out. I believe there's more and more and more of that that are going to be happening from our kids ministry to junior high to our student ministries. Come on, HCY, make some noise to our future young adult ministry that's going to be launching at some point this year to more worship nights, moments where we can get filled up and equipped and then sent out like a revolving door. This is not a country club where we all have matching members only jackets. And I know some of y'all are trying to steal my look by shaving your heads and growing beards, and it's okay. No, but this is not just a gathering of Christians that high five and say, hey, brother blessed, good to see you, sister saved. No, we're equipping, getting filled up, build up, and being sent out into our city and into the world. But how can anyone go if they're not sent? This is why scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. We're talking about the hands and feet of Jesus but the, the, in Romans 10, 14 there, it says, but how can anyone have heard if no one tells them? Have you ever found that little gem, that little spot, that little hole in the wall, maybe that taco spot or that diner, and you don't want anybody to know about it? You know what I'm talking about? Like it's your spot. Like you brag on you like the chicken fried steak is next level. Where, where is it at? I'm not telling you. Because you don't want it to get overcrowded and packed. Where, where, how many of all, you've got that spot? Like you know, okay, cool. Yeah, I love it. You're like, I'm not lifting my hands because you're going to ask me about it later. <laughs> We have a family-owned business here at Hope City, and they took, uh, took us for a tour of their place, and uh, they were like, hey, we're going to go grab some lunch. you have time? I said, absolutely. And we pulled into this gas station, and I was like, well, he must need gas. I'm okay. I've got gas. And he was like, come on, let's go. And I'm like, why? And he was like, come on. I was like, I, I don't want any Cool Ranch Doritos. I'm good. And he was like, no, come on. We're going to eat inside. I'm like, what? Like a taquito? Like from one of those little rolly things? There's a good chance you're going to get a tapeworm from that? I don't know. So I'm like, okay, so we go in. Y'all, it was the best food. I mean, I'm telling you, all the locals knew about it, but nobody talked about it because they didn't want it to get too crowded. Here's the truth. Here at Hope City, we want to romance a bunch of people to Jesus. Romans chapter two, verse four, the goodness and love of God is what draws a man's heart to a place of freedom. The truth is we do want to gather and we do want to romance people to the heart of God. Why? Because we are wanting to see heaven crowded. We want to see more people romance to Jesus. We want to, that's where you can clap. We want to see more people saved. 
set free, healed, and delivered. This is not a secret. We're going to brag about it, and we're going to go. So we're all called. Say, I'm called. To run with purpose and to go. And the truth is, I said it earlier, maybe you're like, I'll never go overseas. I, I would never be able to do that. But you have trust, equity, and a sphere of influence in the people that God's called you to, the world you're entrusted with. They say statistically there's three to four people that actually have trust, equity in your life to the point where you can speak into their life and they'll listen. So you can go into your neighborhoods and talk to your family. You do have a mission field with your job and your community. But you have to run with purpose and you have to go. Jackie mentioned this a few weeks ago, that go, the acronym is simple. It literally means get out. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out in the community. Get out and serve on serve days. Get out of the flesh and walk in the spirit. I stepped on somebody's toes. Because here's the truth. Sometimes it's your character and integrity that speaks volumes to people about your relationship with Jesus. So we have to get out of our comfort zone. We're talking about going and preaching the good news. I love this quote, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. The residue of your relationship with Jesus should and will speak for itself. But I love this directive in the Bible where Jesus, the first thing he says is go. Just like today when you're watching the game, the quarterback would hut, hut, hike when the ball is hiked, he's expecting the team to do what? It's not a trick question. Some of you are like, I hate football. You keep bringing it around. No, they're supposed, to, they're supposed to go. They're literally supposed to run the play. And that's what we're doing every week. We're getting in the huddle and we're running the play. Number two, if you're taking down notes, here's play number two. We have to run with love. And that's a tough one for some people. Because some of y'all are like, I don't like that many people. <laughs> but the unconditional love that we're gonna talk about, it's not about romantic love. That's for the relationship series later on this summer. It's the agape love. It's the God kind of love. And it's easy to say, but what does it look like? Walking in love, the God kind of love is an action. It's a choice to choose to look like Christ. Jesus said in John 13, verse 34, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other as much as I love you. Wow, that's tough. So if we love out of the place that we've received, it's out of the overflow of the love that we received, your strong love for each other, Watch this. We'll prove to the world that you are my disciples. Do you look like Jesus when you walk into a room? Do you look like Jesus when you walk into a room? And because we have to stop acting like walking in love toward people is dependent upon how they treat you. I'm going to choose to walk in love towards people because we're supposed to be, as Christians, setting the standard for what love is. As believers, we have access to the good news, we've heard the truth. So I'm gonna encourage some people today, and this is gonna be freeing. Stop arguing with folks on social media. Stop worrying about all the haters. Stop getting into arguments with people with private accounts and a picture of a cat and six followers, and they don't know you. <laughs> Anything that's robbing you of your peace is too expensive. Amen. So choose to love them, choose to pray for them, and then choose to let God deal with them. I feel like that was for somebody. And once we've received this unconditional love and we've received this type of love, here's what happens. He will begin to transform you to look more like Jesus. John 16, or John 13, 35 says, this is how everyone, how much? Everyone will know that you're my disciples. Again, why? When you love each other. Okay, so let me ask a couple questions. Uh, so you'll love them based upon that they share all the same values and they agree with you 100% of the time? Nope. You love them because they look exactly like you? No. We're called to love each other. Jackie and I are really, really intentional about teaching our kids about diversity. We're really intentional to tell our kids to, we've been teaching our kids, Brecken's 13, Finley's 11, Daphne is five, and Foxman is two and a half. And we teach our kids to see color. Why? Because we want them to see the beauty of God's design. Genesis chapter one, verse 27 talks about the image of God. We want our kids to see the diversity. We want them to see other cultural expressions. We want them to see other people represented. We want them to see color. And so we teach our kids all the time about this. And the other day, Daphne, she's five. And, and we're definitely, I mean, we're leading strong. We're definitely not doing everything right. I do think my Jordan 6 combo is pretty strong today on game day. But I'm not, it's not a big deal, guys. Stop. Don't clap for that. That's ridiculous. Don't clap for that. But we're trying to teach our kids like ab about this daily. My daughter Finley's on the front row. She's 11. We teach them this daily. And so Daphne the other day, she walked over to me and she said, 
my skin is olive. And I said, it is. And she said, yours is real white. I said, thanks for the reminder. Thank you. And then she, I was FaceTiming with my, my buddy uh, Toby, and she said, Uncle Toby's skin is black. I said, yeah, it's black. And then she was at gymnastics for Finn. There was uh, another girl there, and she said, and her, her skin was brown. I said, her skin was brown. And she's talking about all different culture, and, and, and I love it. And we're just talking about diversity, and we're talking about all this. And, and my wife, she sets up this loaded question. Is there any color that's more important than another? And I held my breath for a minute. I was waiting. And she looked down and she was wearing this cute little tutu. And she said, yes, pink. I said, okay, <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take it. Listen, we are called, y'all, as the church to live at a higher standard. We are called to show the world that we can truly love with an unconditional love. And I know, let me say this. I'm not discrediting anybody that's ever hurt you. I'm not discrediting anything that's ever gone through your life. I get it. But when we choose to love and we choose to heal from what hurt us, we'll stop bleeding on people that didn't cut us. And so a lot of times we, amen, a lot of times we put things on people that never hurt us. And so I'm choosing love. I'm choosing to stand on the word of God and trust that God can speak through us as a church and continue to reach people far from God. A lot of times people will read your life before they'll ever read the Bible. And when you lean into the presence of God, it will unlock compassion in your life. I use this verse a lot. I reference this verse a lot because I really want us to grab this as a church. Colossians chapter three, verse 17 says, and whatever you do or say, this is a loaded one. Do it as a representative of Jesus. Because here's the truth. You can't and we can't change anyone. Only God can. But as representatives of Jesus, we can point them to the one that can heal, restore this full of grace and mercy and will set people free. So we as representatives have to lean in and have a, this is, our, this is our thought process, ready? A there you are, not here am I sort of approach. So when you walk into a room, there you are, I see you. There you are, not here am I. And I'm telling you, that will go a long way. Somebody say amen. amen. The last play that we're gonna run as a church, as a church family, unified together, is we have to choose to run together. And I know it's easy to say, but we have to choose to run together. I've said this quote a hundred times the past six months, but it's true. The enemy wants you to run alone because if you want to go somewhere fast, go alone. But if you want to go somewhere far, we have to go together. That's why I'm saying join a group, go through growth track, get on the dream team, serve, sow, be a part of what God is doing. Find family in community. I was... Um, Every time I put my sermon together, I, I'll put on like a backdrop. So Josh was in my office the other day and I'll turn on like Animal Planet. Not the weird stuff, like the black, the black tip bat who will sweep down and grab something. It's like, oh Lord, like nothing scary. Um, but I was watching something and I unmuted it while I was working on a sermon. The Holy Spirit, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit is our comforter, but he is the helper who helps. And it's amazing that if you're listening, God can even speak to you through Animal Planet. Come on, somebody. And so I was watching and they were talking about packs and groups of animals that actually stay together in a pack. And specifically, they were talking about lions. And so they would gather together, and there was this other pack of gazelles. And there was this one gazelle who thought he was good on his own. He was a little weaker than everybody else, and the lions, they were, they were real, real, they were real smooth about it. They stayed on the outskirts, and they stalked this group of gazelles for a day or two. And the guy came on, he's like, what the gazelle doesn't know. And I was pulled in. I mean, like, I wish I had. Y'all would have received so much better if I was like, in the Bible says, in John chapter 13, you'd be like, I love this guy. But instead, I sound like this. Anyways, but he was talking about how the gazelle decided to just do it on his own. I don't need y'all. I don't need a group. I don't need a growth track. I don't need a dream team. I don't need to serve. I don't need to give anything. I don't need, some of y'all are like, that was on Animal Planet? Just follow me. No, no, he decided that he was better on his own. The enemy loves it when you find yourself in isolation. That's when old habits creep back in. That's when figure eight struggles, things that you used to be redeemed from and restored from, the enemy opens up a new uh, a door and you're back right into that addiction, that trap, that toxic relationship. Don't do life alone. No, no, no. Don't, not even about don't do life alone. Be better together. Make sure that you're leaning in and recognizing that there is safety. Look at the person next to you and say, there's safety in the pack. Come on. But as soon as the gazelle got outside of the pack, y'all know what happened. I don't have to go into it. The lion attacked. There is a real enemy. His name is the devil. 
but our God is way bigger. But if you give place to the enemy and you find yourself in this isolated place, the enemy has access to attack. So get in the presence of God. Like last week, surround yourself with accountability and people around you. So when the enemy tries to mess with you, he can say, no, 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 don't mess with her. She's surrounded. Don't mess with him. He's got boys all around him. Don't mess with them because they've got a safety in the pack in the community of called Hope City. The beautiful thing about a community, the beautiful thing about doing it together is it's not about you. It's about the team. So you don't have to make this decision to try to do life alone. When the team gets together, the power of the Spirit of God is with us. We can run plays as, our, as family. We can run plays in our jobs, our neighborhoods, and our city. We can truly know God and truly find freedom, discover our purpose, and make a difference. In Romans chapter 12, this team together sort of community is described as the body of Christ. And this is what it says in verse 4 through 6. And in this way, we are like the various parts of a human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Come on, say out loud, I'm chosen by God. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of the body, but as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned to all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts of Christ's body, this part right here is where it shifts. Let's just go ahead and be what we're made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. I said this earlier, but the truth is you don't have to be called to the worship team. What are you called to? Maybe it's hospitality. Maybe you'll be the best smiley, greeter, parking lot, kids worker. Come on, somebody. There's room for you. You don't have to be up on the stage playing keys like Sam. What has God asked you to do? Because we've all made up and we're all making up the various parts of the body of Christ. The truth is God wants us to be passionate about his church. This is the heartbeat of heaven. And when you plant your Life in the house of God, it will produce fruit in your life. When you sow your time, when you bring your tithes, when you give your offerings, when you sow into what God is doing and you serve your time, your talent, your treasure, and you sow that into the house of God, there will be fruit according to the Bible that will come back to you. So again, weekly, we gather in the huddle. Weekly, we get on the same page, the master plan from the Holy Spirit so that we can leave these four walls, run the plays. So number one, we run with purpose. Number two, we run with love. Number three, we run together. Close your eyes for just a moment. God, today, I think that we go, we love, we live our lives as a local church. I'm going to ask this question whether when your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed for a minute, will you join the huddle? Like, will you really make a commitment to dig your heels in and be a part of what God's doing? Where you're not just a spectator that shows up and sings some songs and leaves, but you'll actually be a part of this community that you're called to? The other question besides will you join the huddle is will you choose to run the play together? Will you be a part, whether here or Cinco or of our online community or the Woodlands here at West Houston? Daniel, I, I wanna belong. And the truth is this is a church where you can belong even before you believe because we'll help you walk with God. And we'll walk with you hand in hand so that you can know him as your savior. But we're all called, every single one of us. If you have breath in your lungs and you woke up again today, then he's not done with you yet. We are all called to go. Some of you, maybe you feel called to give towards missions, outreaches, and opportunities. Maybe you've sown towards the silos. Maybe you've been a part of, of helping us get that property so that we can go vertical and reach thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. Thank you for your generosity. We're never a church that asks you to give a specific amount. We just ask that you would say, God, what would you have me do? And this just be simply obedient. But when you're called to a house and your roots are deep, you can't help but get plugged in. You'll want, to, you'll, you'll want to sow. You'll want to serve. You'll want to be a part. Look at me real quick. I'm going to let you in on this. I didn't say this last week or last service. I used to move everything around. I don't think I've ever said this before publicly, but I used to move everything around on our schedule. Everything. I wife Jackie and 
mid-2015, the first time I came to Hope City was March of 15, a few months after they launched in January. And I say they because I, I wasn't a part yet. And I remember moving everything around and my wife would say, what is it about Hope City? And I'd say, babe, there's something different. When we say things like heaven's touching earth, there's something different about this community. There's something different about this incredible group of people. I'm telling you, I hear churches talk about heaven touching earth and a church that looks like heaven, but it's different. I'd move my whole schedule around to be here. I'd fly in as guest minister and I'd lead worship or I'd preach. Jeremy Foster and I became really close before Hope City launched and really close in the, the season that we were coming. And then God shifted something in Jackie and I to move to Texas. Her roots are here in Houston. And I remember God speaking to us and telling us this was a legacy move. This is where we grow old together. This is where our kids grow up. Not seeing a church of segregation, but seeing a church that does life together. So when this whole thing went down and God shifted and asked us to be the leaders of this church, seven years of shifting everything around, doing whatever it took to just be in a worship moment with you guys, now having the opportunity and the incredible privilege to serve you is the dream of my life. And I pray that you don't judge my passion until you really hear my heart. I am so excited about watching the ground swell. And I know that's a very churchy thing to say and watching faith rise, but I'm telling you, if you will lean in and you will listen to the heartbeat of God and the still small voice of the Lord, you can hear him calling in people. You can hear him breathing life into families. You can hear him breathing life into broken bodies and broken homes. You can see the spirit of God moving in the intricacies of lives that are far from God. So you might've shown up as a first time guest today. Maybe you've called Hope City for home for a long time. My challenge is, will you join the huddle? Thank you, sir, I love you. And will you be a part of what God's doing here? This is not a membership sign up. It's a, will you go further? Can we go deeper? And can we romance a lot more people to Jesus together? Come on, somebody should give God praise. With your eyes closed, just for a moment across all of our locations. If you're here today and you said, Daniel, the truth is I don't know Jesus. I, I love to go into all the world. I love to have that type of relationship. I'd love to love people, but I haven't received that love myself. And I would absolutely love to do this together. But the truth is I feel broken, defeated, undervalued, overlooked, fragile, damaged goods, because I don't know Jesus. But today I want to. While you were preaching today, I felt something in the room. I felt something online that said, today's my day. I want to make things right with Jesus, or maybe you're the second invitation and you say, I fell away. I used to walk with Jesus, but I got caught up in the broken prodigal life and I've been only choosing me. And the truth is, I almost feel so fragile that he wouldn't take me back. The truth is, he's just one mention of his name away from being right there again. He'll wrap you up in his arms like a good, good father. One, when I hit three, I want you to lift up your hands if you're talking, Dan, or lift up your hand if you say, Daniel, you're talking to me. I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Today's my day. February 13th, 2022, today's my day to make everything right with Jesus across all of our locations. If you're watching online, type yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand. You're talking about me. Today's my day. I see a hand, I see a hand, I see a hand. I see a hand back here, hand, hand, hand. I see a hand, I see a hand. I see hands all the way in the back. You can put your hands down all the way in the back. I saw you. Will everybody pray this prayer with us as a church family? Say, Jesus, it's me. Today's my day where I fully surrender. I repent for every struggle, every sin, every issue. I surrender it all and I lay it at your feet. You've been better than good to me. When others have ran out on me, you have stayed consistent and faithful. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, let's give God praise.